Hello everyone and welcome back to another Live at Five virtual tour. I am your curator, Kevin Atkinson, with the Center for Collections and Research. And today I'm coming to you outside the Art Museum and we're going to talk about Marc de Souvreau's uh, landmark red sculpture from 1998 for Mother Teresa. And I have talked about this sculpture before on a Live at Five on Facebook. Um, and so I thought that I would bring it over to Instagram so that we can study this soaring 62 foot tall pile of metal together. And the piece has been here uh, since about 2000, a gift of Margot Cohen uh, Feinberg in honor of Maurice Cohen. Uh, this sculpture actually originated in the studio of Marc de Souvreau in Long Island City, and then it was on the Navy Pier in Chicago as a loan for a number of years. And then it came to Cranbrook around the same time that many of the elm trees that used to be on this corner died. And there was a thought of sort of bringing a sculpture into this newly opened corner of the campus. Now, once it was installed here, it is uh, this sort of steel construction that is completely counterbalanced by this giant rusting part of steel that is holding the suspended stainless steel uh, mouse or habit sort of flinging around. And Mark de Souvereau is always working in this sort of style where he uh, sort of considers it sketching with an arc welder. Uh, he doesn't make sketches with pencil. He doesn't make models with balsa wood. He starts with cranes and he moves the, cra the steel beams and pieces of his uh, uh, scrap yard using the crane. He said that when he first bought his large scale cranes, he felt like a pianist who had never had a piano. Uh, there, the crane became the sort of extension of his body. And so at his studio in Long Island City, uh, he keeps scrap steel and steel beams all around the environment, and he calls them sort of just sculptures waiting to find themselves, uh, because there is no such thing as a bad piece of scrap metal in the world of Marc de Souvereau. So who was this artist? He's not a Cranbrook artist. Of course, he is uh, one of the country's leading sculptures and has won pretty much every award you can in sculpture. Uh, he does have an affiliation with the University of Michigan. He has an honorary uh, doctorate in art there. And there's, of course, a Marc de Souvreau outside of the University of Michigan Museum. The sculptor was born in 1933 in Shanghai to Italian uh, Sephardic Jews. His father was in a naval attaché for the Italian Navy, and he grew up around the Forbidden City in Beijing. During World War II, the family moved to San Francisco, where Marc de Souvereau studied at the City College San Francisco, UC Santa Barbara. And he was studying philosophy when he realized, I'm never going to have a new contribution to philosophy. This caused a sort of existential crisis. And so the artist switched to sculpture, uh, graduating eventually from UC Berkeley. He had his breakout as a sculptor. We're seeing here his full name, Marco Polo de Suvaru. And so th this is his signature uh, cut out using a, a, a sculptor, uh, what does he call it? Using the tool where he uses the torch as a pencil. So this has been cut out of flat steel with a torch and then welded onto the piece. He had his breakout as a sculptor in 1960 with a series of shows and galleries in New York, but he wasn't making enough money as a sculptor, and so he was also working in construction, and he fell down an uh, elevator shaft on March 26, 1960, uh, almost, uh, what is that, is that 71 years ago this March? Uh, and he injured his spinal cord. It was unclear if he would ever walk again. Today he walks with the assistance of a cane uh, in a wheelchair. And 
once he had sort of broken himself through this side job, the construction gig, he really decided to dedicate himself fully to uh, sculpture, but he also couldn't work in the same manner that he had been working. And so he began uh, to learn how to weld and the welding became his, his sort of signature sculptures move. He worked in um, France in the 1970s uh, and then in California and finally in 1986 he ended up buying a sort of trash dump, a landfill in Long Island City in Queens. He ended up turning it into his own studio and then the Socrates Sculpture Park where over 900 artists including many Cranbrook uh, um, uh, many Cranbrook alums have exhibited at Socrates Sculpture Park. So it's a way for him to give up and coming sculptures, sculptors, a sort of blank canvas in which to display their art. Also, if you go to Socrates today in New York City, uh, you'll see plenty of Mr. de Suvereau's works. He works in a number of materials, though ours is just in painted steel, stainless steel, and uh, rusting steel. He also works with timber, he works with tires, he works with um, structural steel, but also scrap metal and sort of pressed metal. He's a big sort of advocate of recycling and reusing materials. Now, he combines sort of two movements of art at the late 20th century, abstract expressionism and constructivism. His own terminology for what he does, though, he calls himself not a sculptor, but a poetic structuralist. And so as a poetic structuralist, he is solving structural problems with his art. So I'm going to, now that we know a little bit more about his biography, he is still making work. Um, and so he is still uh, producing and building things with uh, an assistant, a series of assistants, including Cranbrook alum Christopher Yaki. Uh, and Christopher grew up in Royal Oak. He graduated from Cranbrook schools, the high school here in 1994, and he graduated from the Art Academy in 2000 from the sculpture program. And Chris and I were able to go up and inspect the sculpture and also tighten all of the bolts to keep it from falling down. And also with great skill, Christopher recently replaced this cable. And so those of you who have feared having a picnic under this shape or um, sitting under it at a fundraiser, that is a one inch thick uh, solid stainless steel cable that's rated for 10 tons, um, which this stainless steel piece is only about 5,000 pounds. So there's some tonnage left to go. Now, I mentioned that he doesn't mock up the pieces beforehand. So he would have started this sculpture uh, as an unnamed sculpture with just the steel beams. And he uses multiple cranes to literally pick up this beam at full size and start leaning them together and then sort of climbing around using the cranes and different lifts, they begin cutting out the notches to actually get them to stay in place. As it gets more elaborate, uh, we, ha we see this, the counterbalancing mechanism start uh, to take shape. And so this 5,500 pound stainless steel, it looks like a mouse to me. It also looks sort of like a nun's habit, if only for the Mother Teresa name. Uh, this piece is made out of cold bent stainless steel. And he uses a series of, of counterweights with the crane well, where he'll put stacks of sheet steel on certain corners and then pull apart the sort of shape into this great mouse form. Um, it's a lot of extraordinary sort of labor, but using this method, he knows that he can bend up to 20,000 pounds of pressure onto the sheet stainless steel to get it into this patterning. It's then ground down, uh, and the grinding pattern is done by usually one of de Suvaru's assistants. And so we're looking at the pattern in the sun here, and that's coming from the mind of one of the artists who works alongside de Suvaru. There are about four assistants permanently in New York and then two at his studio in California. 
So to, this is again hanging on that one inch stainless steel cable, but to keep the whole piece from falling over because it's not actually attached to anything on the ground, uh, he had to add this counterbalance. And this counterbalance is using some recycled steel uh, pieces from the Long Island Expressway. And so as bridges are taken down in New York, DeSuvru will uh, take the scrap metal, either purchase it or or take it from the construction site uh, as a donation. And so these are actually pieces that had outlived their usefulness holding cars traveling up and down Long Island or perhaps uh, New Jersey roads. And he has welded them together, handily told us how much it weighs, 5,400 pounds. And so this serves as the counterbalance for the 5,500 pound uh, stainless steel figure. Now, he uh, calls this piece for Mother Teresa. Of course, the great saint of Calcutta uh, passed away in 1997, and this piece was 1998. Desuvru gets his names after the sculptures have been fully made, and so he looks at the piece and then he names it. Um, he doesn't always use religious names. Uh, as I mentioned, he was Jewish. Uh, but he admired Mother Teresa's sort of generosity, her spirit, her legacy in the world. And then he saw this piece and said, ah, this is my tribute for Mother Teresa. Now, this is an unusually large DeSuvru because these are 60 foot long steel beams. And in order to transport his pieces, he, he tries to keep them under 45 feet because a 45 foot steel beam can fit on a tractor trailer truck without any special permits. So to get this piece from New York to Chicago and then Chicago to Bloomfield Hills, they had to use special permits for all of the roads that they would cover in every state in order to navigate with these very long parts. Now, I think that's about all I have to say about Mr. De Suvaru's work here. He's a pretty fascinating artist. Um, he's been very generous with younger artists, especially through his Socrates Sculpture Park uh, and allowing other artists to both work in his studio, learn from him, but also giving them the space and the sort of uh, opportunity to show off their work. This piece could not have come to Cranbrook without uh, Margot Cohen-Feinberg, as well as Maxine and Stuart Frankel, who were integral in getting uh, Mr. DeSuvero out here. If you're a dedicated Cranbrook walker, walker uh, or if you've just looked closely at the camera, you'll know that it does need a few thousand dollars worth of red paint on it. And that is a project that the Center for Collections and Research and Cranbrook Art Museum are collaborating on as we await the sort of financial fallout of the COVID-19 crisis and seeing where our budget stands. Uh, this is one of our top priorities is to repaint the piece. But uh, in order to paint it, you also have to strip all the paint down and it is pretty tall. And so it is pretty specialized work uh, to come out and paint this piece. Now, interestingly, this was not the first de Suvaru on the campus. So in 1977, we had Le Petit Cliff, uh, which was a swing set over at Kingswood by Marc de Suvaru, And that was made out of tires, timbers, and scrap steel. Uh, and I believe it's now in a private collection, but it was pretty cool because you could actually swing on it. Uh, next time you're in Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids City Hall also has a swing set by Marc de Suvaru. And as my dad was out in uh, Montana at a sculpture park, they actually take a, um, a big clinger, like a bell clacker, and they actually play the stainless steel feature. Ours is too tall to play. I suppose you could take pin tennis balls and ping it up there. Uh, but he is very interested in sort of how people find a way to interact with his sculptures and how they resonate uh, with the viewer and how they resonate with a clanger, I guess. Uh, when you think about the scale of it, uh, when I'm on tours, people, you don't have a neutral opinion about this work. And usually people say either, oh, they love it, they love Marc de Suvru, or why would you put that red sculpture next to Aelil Saarinen's 
delicate architecture and the question of scale between these um, sort of slightly below 40 foot columns and a 60 foot sculpture. And Mark de Suver would say that relative to a mountain, his sculpture is actually tiny. It's a little breadcrumb. Uh, and then relative to the entire planet, the mountain is a breadcrumb. And then relative to the entire universe, Earth is just a little speck of dust. So is his piece really that big? Uh, and he's very interested in thinking about his work on these different scales. And he's also interested in how the piece sort of changes through the ceiling or through the seasons and how it changes from day to night. It's a pretty iconic work on campus. I love in the winter how it pops up because it is so tall and how you can start to see it over buildings and through trees. Um, I think it's an exciting, pretty dynamic piece to anchor the, this corner of the Academy of Art. If you have any questions, you can send them in a message. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for this Live at Five. Um, on Sunday, we are having a talk from Valerie Bellit, who is the director of the Historic Artist Homes and Studios Network for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, Cranbrook and Sarnen House just joined that August group in February. And so she's going to tell us about the 48 artist homes and studios, including Loya Saarinen's house here at Cranbrook in a talk on Sunday at 3 p.m. On Sunday, March 28th, and you're gonna hear more about this at Live at Five next week, I'll be giving a tour of new Cranbrook art works in Saarinen House, Cranbrook House, and the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House. So do sign up for those two events uh, over at center.cranbrook.edu. You, And if you do watch Live at Five two days a week, tomorrow on Facebook, I'll be doing a tour of Studio Loya Saarinen, the weaving workshop of Mrs. Saarinen. So until next time, everyone, I hope you enjoyed this close look at Cranbrook's largest work of art by Mark, Marco Polo de Suvaru, Mark de Suvaru for Mother Teresa of 1998.